a new organization at Texas State. We just started last semester. And uh, we've been able to do a lot of cool activities with our students and bring in a lot of cool speakers. And the most exciting speaker we've brought in yet is here today. Uh, Dr. Merlin Tuttle is a world-renowned bat biologist. He's been working with bats for nearly 60 years and uh, is a world-renowned photographer for wildlife as well. So um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Merlin Tuttle uh, to give a talk about choosing a career why bats. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to have this opportunity to share with you just a few of the experiences I've had career-wise on behalf of studying bats. As you're about to learn, bats are just full of wonderful surprises and opportunities. I can't imagine a group that's more understudied and overpowered when it comes to interesting things yet to be discovered. Their world is just full of surprises from the brilliant yellow-winged bats of equatorial Africa to the painted bats of Southeast Asia, the snow white ghost bats of Latin America, and right here in Texas we have the king of them all when it comes to spectacular, the spotted bat. <clears throat> Contrary to what you've mostly heard about bats in recent times, you find that they actually have probably the world's finest track record when it comes to living safely with people. They contribute billions of dollars annually to human economies. They support whole ecosystem, the health of whole ecosystems that, upon which we ourselves depend. And they actually safeguard our health by reducing our dependence on chemical pesticides. <clears throat> Now, before we get too far carried into just bats, let's look at my very simple, almost laughably simple recipe for success. And yet, it's amazing how few people are ever pay any real attention to it, even though it's powerful and simple. First of all, follow your passion. <clears throat> do something, choose something that you'd love to do on your next vacation if somebody would just let you do it. Don't go where someone says, okay, you need to do this because this is where the employment's going to be and this is where the best pay is going to be. Pay and employment aren't the two top priorities. First of all, let me point out that employment opportunities are about as stable as the Saharan Desert. They move all the time. I remember when I was in school, Sputnik went up and everybody was going to be a space, science, a, a space engineer. A few years later, there's a glut on the market in space engineers. There's no forecasting exactly what's going to be the next great need in science. So you might as well pick something that you know you're going to be interested in even if things change. <clears throat> Conduct research that helps people. <clears throat> I cannot imagine in the world we live in today, under today's circumstances, continuing to do totally esoteric basic research that has no applied value in solving human problems. I honestly believe that that's one of the reasons why scientists today are complaining so much about trouble getting funding. Too many have lived too long in ivory towers thinking they could do almost anything esoteric regardless of whether it had any applicability to solving real challenges or not. And next, do good science. Some of the poorest science I've ever seen has been coming out in recent time. Just a few weeks ago, Science published a paper based on a sample of one, a questionable partial fragment of RNA, one sample, and making a big deal out of now they may have found the source of Ebola. Uh, that's not what you call good science. We, as scientists, want to test, not prove, hypotheses. And more important than all the rest, learn to be a good entertainer. <clears throat> you know, so many times young people think that they need to learn all the jargon of their field so that they can impress everybody with how much they know. I'm impressed when I hear somebody make a presentation without using any jargon. 
because that proves that you know your field and how to communicate it and you'll probably be successful. Who are the most job secure, best paid people professionally in the world? Who? <laughs> Actuaries, well, I'm not sure about that myself, but uh, I would have picked uh, entertainers. <clears throat> Nobody, nobody's getting paid better than entertainers. And yet we have the front row seat to be the world's finest, best prepared entertainers. As scientists, we're giving the latest expensive gadgetry to play with. We get out on the front lines of nature. Nothing is more interesting to people initially in life than the natural world around them. There are all kinds of opportunities to make discoveries in nature that can be incredibly entertaining, but far too many scientists communicate only to their colleagues. They never pick up on the importance of communicating to the public at large. And we can be incredibly entertained. If you learn to entertain on top of these other things, you'll be successful, I virtually guarantee it. Now, back to some of the reasons why bats. Bats are incredibly sophisticated and diverse. Uh, Almost a fifth of all the world's mammal species, about 1,400 kinds, are bats. They come in, as you can see, just an incredible variety. There are all kinds of things we'd love to know about bats. For example, how is it that bats almost never get arthritis or cancer? How is it that even Tiny bats have been known to live 43 years in the wild, still able to go out and chase down flying insects for dinner every night. That's the equivalent of a 100-year-old person still being able to run sprints through obstacle courses. Wouldn't it be nice to discover how bats do some of those, those things? And in fact, we're just beginning to learn a lot more about how sophisticated bats are. They have social systems strikingly similar to those of higher primates and dolphins. They are quick learners, have long memories, they share information, they help each other in need, they form long-term friendships, and even adopt orphans. And they come with all kinds of interesting adaptations for special skills. Fishing bats have echolocation so sensitive that they can detect an object as fine as a human hair and just one millimeter long on the surface of a pond of water. Pallid bats found right here in Texas are immune even to the deadliest stings of scorpions and centipedes upon which they feed. Disc winged bats have special adhesive discs on their wrists and ankles that enable them to cling to the slick inner surfaces of unfurling leaves where they live. Bamboo bats have specially flattened skulls so that they can just in, with incredible rapidity squeeze in and out of tiny beetle holes in bamboo where they live. These round-eared bats in Latin America have specially strong teeth because they actually chew holes in this almost rock-hard termite nest to make a secure home for themselves. <clears throat> And of all the crazy things you wouldn't expect to find, it's bats that specialize in living in carnivorous plants that eat everything else that enters. Pitcher plants are famous for eating everything from insects to rats. And yet the Hardwick's woolly bat actually prefers to live in pitcher plants and it developed a wonderful symbiotic relationship. <clears throat> This is one of the few pitcher plants that provides an umbrella to keep water from going down inside. It has a special reflective area right here that guides the bat echolocation as it comes in like airport landing lights on a runway at night for a pilot. The <coughs> 
plant has evolutionarily figured out that it pays better dividends to feed on bat droppings daily than to eat a bat once a year. And there are other bats that cut the midribs of tent leaves to build tents. And then some of the most spectacular courtship displays in the world of mammals are found in bats. And you know what? This wonderful display has never been studied. How did I get pictures like this? Well, that's a whole other really fun thing. Can you believe I trained that bat and I never caught him, never touched him, but trained him in the wild. That bat was trained so that when he, he actually learned my Land Rover and when I would pull up beneath his roost and start unloading, he would switch roost to the one where I preferred to film him. And I don't just train bats in the wild. For both research and photography, I've trained many bats in the lab. <clears throat> I carry a portable studio wherever I go. <clears throat> this one I'm trained for a BBC film. He's learning to go where I point. When I met Allison Jolly, a famous uh, primate behaviorist a few years ago in Madagascar, the first questions out of her mouth were, you really train bats? And I said, sure, do it reg regularly. Well, what do you train them to do? Oh, for example, I train them to go catch prey where I point. What? We can't even trade primates to do that. <laughs> True. Well, but by training this bat, now see right now you just see a glass tabletop. You may wonder how nature films are made that get some of these spectacular shots. Well, here's how it's done. The cameraman could shoot from about 15 inches away as this bat caught a frog. I could put four or five frogs in the pond and tell the cameraman which frog the bat was going to catch, which direction the bat was going to come from, all just by advanced hand signals. And then I would be out of the picture and the bat was trained not to come until he heard the camera start. And that's how you get pictures like this. And it was also how I made my first cover story in science. By being able to tame and work with bats in, in captivity, we could perform experiments that would be almost impossible in the wild. And I'm amazed to this day how few bat biologists have picked up on the ease with which we can train bats and how impactful it can be in furthering really good research. Here my wife Paula and I are in Barneo a few years ago photographing little woolly bats. These bats only weigh four grams. That's less than a U.S. nickel. They were thought to be impossible to keep in captivity because they're way too small and fragile. But having done this many times, I persuaded my colleagues there to allow me to try. And as you can see, it worked pretty well. well why, why, am, why am I having to set up a picture like this in my studio instead of doing it in the wild? Well, let me show you. This is what I'd have had to work in in the wild. It would have been <laughs> raining on me about every 20 minutes. And I wouldn't have had any idea which pitcher plant the bat was going to come to next and it would have been a real mess. But working in the studio, I could set up a set where in the picture you cannot tell that I wasn't out in the swamp, but in addition to the photography you can do by having tame and trained bats, there's all kinds of special research you can do. Once my colleagues Michael and Carolyn Schoner understood that you could keep these bats in captivity and tame them and they would go ahead and perform natural behavior under captive conditions. They learned that these bats had the highest frequency echolocation ever found in a mammal, 300 kilohertz. They learned about the reflectiveness of pitcher plants and exactly how it guided the bat in as they came in. They learned all kinds of things that they couldn't learn 
beforehand. Now, this is that same bat. Is he attacking me? No. Here's what happened. The night before, I tamed him and got him used to eating out of my hand so that he wouldn't be afraid of me when we wanted to take pictures. When Paul and I came in the next morning, I no more than came in the studio and he started pestering me. He wanted to be fit. He was training me. <laughs> and he wasn't going to let go until I held up a mealworm. This bat had never seen a human before in his life, had never eaten a mealworm before the night before, had never probably ever caught anything stationary out of a hand, and yet he knew to keep bumping me in the face until I held up my hand and then came and took the mealworm. Now, if you think that's incredible, I've got an even better story for you. This woolly bat is a different species of woolly bat found in Taiwan. I was funded to go to Taiwan several years ago to teach biologists there how to take, how to photograph bats chasing down crop pests, prey. Unfortunately, when we got there, it poured down rain day in and day out. We couldn't catch any bats to work with until 48 hours before we were supposed to leave the country. And there's nothing more difficult than a real authentic chase. That's not photoshopped. That's a real authentic chase. Uh, so, I figured I was just going through the motions because they had funded me to do it, that there was no way of getting this picture at that point. The first night in captivity, this bat turned out, you know, each bat, just like people, has its own IQ and personality. This bat decided to be one of those that just was not going to cooperate. He wouldn't touch a mealworm to eat one out of my hand. I knew, and in fact, this is a new species just discovered. Now, I was going to be in a heck of a lot of trouble if big time conservationists killed the first specimen of a new species. <laughs> <laughs> and so I gave up part of my collection of live moths, which were precious to me, put them in the studio flying around, and went away to see if he would catch some of them on his own so that he could at least be kept alive without starving until the next night. Came back a few minutes later and there were wings on the floor, so I thought, okay, so he'll, he'll at least survive here. The next night, this bat still had not eaten one thing from my hand, still had not eaten a mealworm. I had only rubbed him on his face trying to get him to accept the idea that they might be good if he opened his mouth. <laughs> but I come in the next evening and before I even got to the studio, he's flying over, landing on the side of the studio, trying to get to me. I go in the door, and he immediately flies up and starts bumping me in the face, just like the Hardwick's woolly bat in Borneo. I was incredulous. The bat turned out to be so smart that we actually got one of the finest pictures I've ever taken in my life of a real chase, a bat chase in a moth. That very evening, we were able to train the bat so that in just a few tries, he knew not to f just fly around, that I wouldn't release a moth while he was flying because I wouldn't know where he was coming from and couldn't get my shot. So he learned he had to go sit in a certain place in my studio before I would release a moth. Only then would he come, and because he was such an incredible quick learner, I got that picture, which I must say I'm more than a little bit proud. <laughs> save, save my image in Taiwan, too. <laughs> uh, now, as I travel around the world, I frequently try to return to places where I've seen hundreds of thousands, even millions of bats in the past. And I can't tell you how disappointing it is to go back expecting to see something like this and see no bats at all because some fool who was misinformed about bats, set fire to the cave or dynamited or did something else uh, to kill the bats. So why should we be really concerned about the plight of bats? And let me point out that today, right here in America, bats are our most rapidly declining mammals. With all the challenges that people face, why, why spend time studying bats? 
Well, let me point out that oftentimes the single best thing we can do for people is to help heal the damage we've done to nature. I'm now going to tell you my very first experience of international bat conservation. These monks at Khao Chung Pran Cave in Thailand made their living selling bat guano fertilizer. <clears throat> Sales were plummeting. They didn't know why. They asked me if I could investigate and figure out why guano production was down. It didn't take me very long to figure out that it was because poachers were sneaking in at night and setting nets over the cave entrance, killing many tens of thousands of bats and selling them for people to eat in restaurants. I convinced them to hire a game warden. Ten years later, I returned again, and guano sales had gone from $12,000 a year to $89,000 a year. And a few years after that, they passed 135,000 a year. Not only that, but the emergences became so impressive that they attracted the attention of biologists. And a few of these picture, pictures I show you down at the bottom, the citation in case you want to look up the paper that documents what we're talking about. <clears throat> a group of international biologists came to Khao Chong Pran and looked into the impact of these bats in controlling white-bellied plant hoppers, one of the most costly crop pests of rice all across Southeast Asia. They concluded that this one restored colony of bats was saving local rice farmers an estimated, a conservatively estimated, 300,000 US dollars annually. And as the bats became still more spectacular, they started attracting thousands of tourists. And the locals were quick to take advantage of the tourism. Unfortunately, I haven't yet convinced anybody to go back and do a full economic study, but what we need more than anything in some of these cases is to have someone go back and do a really good scientifically conducted economic study to show just how much conservation means to people. But I dream that one of these days we'll document that those bats are probably worth in excess of a million dollars a year now to one small community in Thailand. And with that kind of experience, I've been more and more encouraged to educate people wherever I go. We as scientists have a responsibility. If we don't communicate to the rest of the world beyond our colleagues about the importance of nature and protecting it, who will? It's my goal to always leave more bats behind than when I arrived. What I mean is convince people to protect them better so that there will be more next time rather than fewer. This family right here in Thailand met a single bat researcher years ago who got them excited about their painted bats, pointed out that they could be an interesting tourist attraction, and now that family carefully protects the largest remaining population known of painted bats. Here, the Philippine government was just ready to forcibly have the largest bat cave remaining in, Phil in the Philippines uh, buried under farmland. I was asked by the owners of the cave to come and intercede on their behalf. It took me less than an hour to present a public lecture on bats in which I showed that the bats from that one cave could pollinate literally tens of millions of durian flowers in a single night. That's a multi-billion dollar a year fruit crop, one of the most, one of the favored ones from that part of the world. One hour later, I'm seated with the uh, mayor. Community leaders were signing a successful petition to have that cave protected as critical habitat, and today it is protected as critical habitat and 
has a major interpretive center associated with it, educating people from all over the world about bats. <clears throat> we know the story of Bracken Cave. When I first came to Texas, all you could hear about free-tailed bats in Texas was that they were rabid and dangerous. Today, we have at least 12 major viewing sites where millions of these bats are protected as a tourist attraction for people from all over the world. Now, while, while you hear about the problems of raising money for, con for research, let me point out that communicating with the public may not be the shortest route to getting outside funding, but it's certainly an excellent route. In my career, I have raised tens of millions of dollars for research and conservation on bats and never once got one penny from the NSF, NIH, or any of the other major funders you're supposed to go to for money. I did it all by doing good science and learning to entertain people and showing the relevance of how what I was doing was going to help them. Here's a good example. Peter Taylor, a colleague of mine in South Africa, discovered that um, bats were the primary predators of green stink bugs, the most costly uh, pest of macadamia orchards. He had the data, but he didn't have pictures. And as I'll point out later, and as you already know, one good picture is worth a thousand words. So I went to South Africa, Paul and I did, and uh, photographed bats catching green stink bugs. I gave one presentation to the Macadamia Growers Association, and immediately thereafter, they funded not just one, but two full PhD level research programs on how to attract more bats to macadamia orchards. Once we start doing things that people can see the relevance of, communicate what we do well, entertain them well, we're on the right track to security. Now, Let's take a look at what bats that eat fruit and pollen and nectar uh, contribute, starting with the Sonoran Desert here in the United States. <clears throat> From the southwestern U.S. all the way out into the Caribbean and down to Chile and the Andes, there are literally hundreds of species of agave and cactus plants that rely mostly on bats for pollination or seed dispersal or both. This long-nosed bat is pollinating a cardone cactus, the world's biggest cactus. It gets up to 60 feet tall. Bats carry more pollen farther and more seeds farther than any other pollinator or seed disperser. These bats have been documented to carry pollen at least 60 miles at one way in a single night. The plants that they're servicing provide food and shelter for all sorts of other wildlife. This Gila woodpecker is nesting in a Cardone cactus, feeding its chicks the fruit of another species of bat-dependent cactus. And these long-nosed bats are obviously doing a great job of pollinating the agave from which all tequila and much of the mezcal industry of Mexico relies. Multi-billions of dollars annually that could be lost without bats. As we go farther south into the rainforest area, approximately half of all mammal species are bats and they play absolutely crucial roles in maintaining these forests that have been likened to the lungs and air filters of our planet. This is a Corolia bat. Just one of these little bats can carry as many as 60,000 seeds to new locations in a single night. If even one-tenth of one percent of those seeds 
survives to land in a place where it can grow into new seedling, that's a hell of a lot of new seedlings every year from just one bat. Go around all the way to the other side of the world to the savannas of East Africa and we find the giant baobab, one of the world's most famous trees, a tree that uh, is often eulogized as literally a tree of life because it supports so many other animals is in turn dependent upon bats for pollination. And the fruit of it, and as is so often the case, bat pollinate and seed dispersed plants of great ecological value are also of great economic value. It's been discovered in recent years that the baobab's fruit is one of the richest sources of natural vitamins in the world, and its fruit now sells for a billion dollars a year. Go to Southeast Asia, and I mentioned the durian, a multi-billion dollar a year fruit crop that can't be grown even in an orchard without bats to pollinate the flowers. And yet, believe it or not, everywhere I have been, from the Philippines to Thailand, farmers growing durian commonly put up nets and try to kill the very bats that are pollinating their flowers. Why do they do that? Because they, these flowers, as soon as they've been pollinated, they drop their petals and non-essential remaining parts to the ground. So the farmer sees all these bats come into his orchard, and as they're leaving, the flowers are all falling to the ground, and they're thinking, oh my God, I'll be lucky if I have any crop at all this year. So they completely misunderstand what's going on, I haven't found a single one of those farmers I couldn't convince in 10 minutes or less that the bats are actually essential rather than harmful. And yet, things like this continue to go on today for a lack of scientists who care enough to stop and talk to people about reality. Where would the world be without bananas? Our modern bananas are severely threatened by fungal diseases that can only be treated with genes from wild ancestral types of bananas that uh, still remain resistant. What happens if through neglect of bats we lose as wild progenitor species of bananas? What happens to future crop production? Some 70% of all the world's tropical and subtropical fruits come from plants that in the wild depend on bats for either pollination or seed dispersal. Now I think I can rest my case about the importance of fruit and nectar eating bats. Let's go to those, the 70% that eat insects. <clears throat> These bats are coming from Bracken Cave. <clears throat> and I see Sarah here in the audience, Sarah Steves. Her parents were among the first people in Texas who helped me save this cave, which today is protected in a 2,500-acre nature reserve. But back in those days, nobody understood why in the world we'd want to save a nuisance like the bats from Bracken Cave. These bats eat an estimated, let's say, about... Nobody knows exactly how many bats are in a cave. Do you ever try to count 10 or 20 million bats? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but let's say 10 million. At 10 million, these bats are going to eat approximately 100 tons of insects in a night. And they're not just going anywhere. On an average summer night, here's Doppler weather radar at 6.15 in the evening, showing them coming from three major bat caves. And what's this? This stippling over here is caused by crop pests coming off of agricultural lands. Look where the bats are going just 12 minutes later. They're literally going over and engulfing the area of crop pests. Back when we first discovered this through meteorologists who couldn't believe their eyes when they first saw it, Gary McCracken and John Westbrook, I convinced them to come down and do some research to determine what the bats' impact was in controlling crop pests. And back then, 
this shows what enormous opportunities are opening to us today, the next generation, to work on bats. This is 20 years or so ago. Back then, they had to have probably close to a million dollar mobile radar unit on hand. They had to loft a thousand dollar bat ultrasonic microphone thousands of feet into the sky expecting never to see it again. Listen for bat sounds thousands of feet above ground and they knew that if they heard the bats doing feeding buzzes just as the balloon approached the migrating incoming moths that that would be credible evidence that they were feeding on the moth pests. Today we could achieve all those same discoveries at not even a tenth the cost. We wouldn't have to send balloons up and lose all of our equipment. We wouldn't have to have a mobile radar unit. All we'd have to do is have barcoding gene typing. But what did they find? They found that there are literally billions of our most costly billion dollar crop pests in America that migrate into Texas every spring from Mexico. Each moth is carrying 500 to 1,000 eggs. Just one of these bats can catch at least 20 to 40 of these moths in a night. Let's take this conservatively and say that it only does ha the 20 in a night. At that rate, it's still going to prevent 10 to 20,000 eggs from being laid. That's enough to force a Texas farmer to spray multiple acres of cropland at a cost of $74 an acre. I know that a lot of scientists still tend to lean toward going out and doing what they call basic research that doesn't have any applied value, but I'll tell you something. Gary will never be so famous in his life for any other discovery than making this one. And these, these are being made now around the world in part because of his pioneering work here in Texas. In fact, here's one of the more recent studies. In the Mediterranean, colleagues set up small bat houses around a 12 hectare plot of rice crop. And they showed that over a period of several years they were able to attract enough bats to completely eliminate the need for spraying pesticides on those rice crops. Now this does exemplify a really important point, one that I, if I had more time, would certainly make. Bats are a perfect first step in enabling us to restore biodiversity where we've ruined it with huge monocultures in recent past. Why are bats first most important in restoring diversity? Because, for example, the free tail bats we just talked about, they can fly thousands of feet above ground, catch tailwinds that speed them at a hundred miles an hour to travel to distant places to feed out over large monoculture areas where other animals would no longer be able to feed. But if we don't at some point preserve some amount of biodiversity, you see this is natural forest over here. If that forest wasn't there, these bats would all starve to death between growing seasons for rice. They couldn't survive. So the bats are the perfect entree in getting people interested in restoring biodiversity. They can actually see what happens and measure it, and then it spreads to other things as well. Another study, this one done by B. Moss and Associates in Indonesia. They calculated using exclusion netting that uh, cacao trees, when protected against, so that bats couldn't come in and feed around them, lost a whole bunch of extra crop damage as opposed to the ones that the bats could protect. They in fact estimated that the bat 
services were valued at approximately $780 million a year to the cacao industry. Now, again, that wouldn't be true except cacao is often grown in association with native habitat in the vicinity, so the bats have alternative places to feed when, when they're not feeding on the pests of cacao. Now with all these incredible new discoveries being made, one might expect that scientists and the news media would be communicating the great wonders of the world of bats and why they're so important. But I hate to tell you, there still seems to be more profit in scaring people about bats. Just last year, National Public Radio aired a program in which they said bats, direct quote, bats are arguably one of the most dangerous animals in the world. And get this, so when there are bats in the sky, there could be Ebola in the poop that lands on your shoulder. Never even mention that you can't get Ebola in the United States and that there is no evidence, no proof that Ebola ever came from bats to begin with and never a case in world history in which somebody got a serious disease from a bat pooping on them. <laughs> So we have here in Texas the perfect answer to that claim, which is basically just wild speculation to raise scare money. When hundreds of thousands of bats began moving into newly created crevices under the Congress Avenue Bridge in Austin in the early 1980s, media had a heyday. Public health officials said that the bats were mostly rabid, dangerous, would attack people, made newspaper headlines nationally and around the world, claiming that hundreds of thousands of rabid bats were invading and attacking the citizens of Austin. This is the kind of conditions I found there. <laughs> this is how people felt about bats arriving in Austin. <clears throat> I decided, and, and, and what's really interesting looking back, is how often just a single scientist who takes even a small amount of time to communicate with the public can change the whole course of further events. I decided that those bats, any city that had that many bats and that many news media with nothing better to do than talk about them, would be the perfect location to center my conservation education campaign. I point out that bats only bite in self-defense if grabbed by a human, by a careless human. Uh, they do not attack people and they pose no threat to the people of Austin. And my promises have been borne out. 35 years later, we're still waiting for the first person to be attacked. We're still waiting for the first person to contract a disease from one of our bats. But what have we learned? Our bats are eating literally tons of crop and yard pests every night. They're bringing in 10 million tourist dollars every summer. And Austin has become the world's center for educating people to a better appreciation of living in harmony with nature and the advantages of doing so, including with such misunderstood creatures as bats. Now, what are the alternatives to learning to live in harmony with nature? We hear a lot about pesticides and not nearly enough about how dangerous they are. Back in 1942 when we first introduced pesticides in agriculture in America, within 10 years, crop losses to pests, to, to pests insect pests, rose by almost double. That's quite a commentary on the value of pesticides. And now we hear about the pesticide treadmill, which has been coined by entomologists with regard to the fact that the pesticides kill the pest controllers, the natural controllers of insect pests, far faster than they control the pests. And I set about not long ago to discover just what impact that was having. I'd go to CDC's website, World Health, and it almost sounded like they were like adding vitamins to the world. Uh, 
But I dug a little further and went to the scientific literature on Google Scholar, found multiple review studies. This one cites 480 studies. And what did they conclude? There's a huge body of evidence in relation, on the relationship between exposure to pesticides and elevated rate of chronic diseases such as cancer, diabetes, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, birth defects, and reproductive disorders. Chronic diseases are the most important global health part problems. It is time to find a preventive approach logically by reducing pesticide use. And yet, what do we hear about in the media? We're all about to die of a pandemic caused by bats, when in fact bats have never been known to cause a major pandemic in world history. Even SARS, is, which was a minor, minor pandemic, uh, still, despite millions of dollars worth of research, can't be laid at the feet of bats. Ebola, you've all heard, comes from bats, and yet there's still not a shred of scientifically credible proof that Ebola came from bats. Uh, while we're spending billions of dollars looking for s potentially dangerous viruses in bats that might someday but never have pose significant threat to people, we're being diverted our attention to those things instead of paying attention to things like this that are really killing us right here at home. So, let's say you've decided you'd like to have a career in studying bats. How would you go about learning to study bats? Well, there are workshops and training opportunities every year. We offer them. <coughs> Last spring, <coughs> these citizen scientists, we call them, joined us in Cocobola Nature Reserve in Panama to document the uh, importance and needs of bats there. This, whoops, this young man in the green t-shirt is not a trained biologist. He's never had a course in biology in his entire life. He's a top executive from a major food manufacturing company, but he loves bats. And on his own, he has learned so much about bats that he probably knows more than most of my colleagues with PhDs in bat biology. And he now helps us teach other people how to study bats. You don't necessarily have to even become a scientist to be a part of improving the world around us and helping with conservation and knowledge of things like bats. And everybody needs a mentor. Don't ever hesitate to contact somebody for help just because they're a big time famous person and you assume they're too busy and wouldn't have time to pay attention to you. I convinced my mother to take me to the Smithsonian when I was just a teenager too young to drive a car. She had to drive me to the Smithsonian and I got out and went to the front desk and asked the secretary, said that I had some, said that I had some field notes and a voucher specimen and that I'd been observing gray bats doing things that the book said they didn't do. And I'd like to talk to one of the mammologists. Well, to my great surprise, Charlie Hanley, chairman of the Division of Mammals for the Smithsonian, came down to meet me. He was so impressed with my young data keeping that he ended up spending half a day showing me around and teaching me about bats and when I graduated from college a few years later, I'd gotten better acquainted with him. He actually <clears throat> gave me my first adult employment leading a huge research project for the Smithsonian that in today's dollars would be a multi-million dollar project. Just from that one teenage contact, and then when I finished that project, guess what? I know that a lot of you probably think that you'd love to be scientists, but you're not smart enough. Well, forget that idea. We're all smart enough to do what we're really passionate about doing. Determination de determines a lot more, contributes much more to our success than, than necessary brain power. I was determined. I was a 
tortoise and the tortoise and hare race. I was always a bit slow learning. And, in fact, I graduated from college with grades so marginal I barely made it out. And I ended up unable to get into a good graduate school for my bad grades. But Charlie Handley came along and vouched for me and got me into the top school in America in my field at the time. I got in on probation, graduate, I'm proud to say, the second in the history of the school with honors on a PhD. Our modern academic system very often selects for the wrong things, uh, unfortunately. But persevere, be determined, and you'd be amazed where you can get. This is an important name to remember. I would like to see every student and professor here read this paper titled Strong Inference, published in 1964 in the journal Science. It's published by a preeminent scientist on how to do good research. He points out that not all research is equal. There's good research and bad research. And you'll like this. He asserts that doing great science is a skill that can be learned and contrary to popular mythology, one that does not require superhuman intellectual gifts. So in summary, if you want a really fun, productive career, follow your passion. What you're really passionate about, you'll work hard enough at to get where you need to go. Conduct research that helps people. You'll almost always be supported that way. And there's a lot of very good research that very much needs to be done that does help people. Do good science. Don't try to prove hypotheses. Test hypotheses. That's what science is about. These virologists lately that have been trying to lay Ebola and everything at the feet of bats are trying to prove hypotheses instead of test hypotheses, and soon enough, their funding is going to dry up when people catch on they've been crying wolf. Learn to entertain. If you can just learn to do a great job of entertaining, you'll have it made. Even back when I was studying frog-eating bats, and I have to admit there's hardly anything more esoteric than studying frog-eating bats, <coughs> Never once did anybody raise their hand in an audience after one of my talks and say, but Dr. Tuttle, why do you do that kind of research? What's the purpose in it? I heard that question asked time and time again of colleagues that actually were doing research that had more importance than what I was doing in terms of applied value. But what was the difference? They didn't entertain well enough. Nobody gets paid better than an entertainer. If you entertain people really well with what you do, they'll love it and won't even ask why. <laughs> Seek mentors. Don't be afraid to ask. You don't get what you don't ask for. And finally, but not last, and remember photos. One photo is worth a thousand words. When I started out, we had to carry big bulky cameras around to get pictures that aren't half as good as the ones you can take today on your cell phone. There is no excuse for not documenting the research you do and documenting it well, turning it into an exciting story that the public will be interested in. The reason so much scientists, so many scientists are struggling so hard for funds these days, is they just haven't had a good public relations campaign going. They haven't entertained enough people. And so people don't understand why they're doing what they're doing. And oftentimes it's a good thing they don't because what they're doing isn't important. We live at a time in world history where we cannot afford to do unimportant science. We face all kinds of enormous environmental challenges. And it's your generation that's going to make a huge difference. My generation is already screwed up. Most of the terrible damage done to the environment has occurred since 1950. We're leaving a heck of a mess for the next generation, 
but I trust that there will be people right here in this room that will step up and make a real difference. As you've seen tonight, one determined person, even a hare and even a tortoise in the tortoise and hare race, can make a very big difference. This is an area that, as I've just shown, is extremely relevant to human well being. What group of animals is more relevant to people than bats? What group of animals is more sophisticated or diverse? or widespread. Anywhere you go in the world, you got bats present, bats that are interesting, bats that would be fun to do research on. They've been neglected for so long and unjustifiably feared that I would guess that 90% of the world's bat species have yet to be just studied beyond simply being described as species. We know almost nothing about most of the bats of the world and we very much need to learn. We're talking about a frontier that is wide open, about as exciting as you can get, and I hope to maybe mentor one or two of you, or maybe four or five or 10 of you one day, <laughs> in going out there and making a really big difference. Thank you. Now we have plenty of time. Anything I didn't answer that you would like answered that you think a tortoise might be able to answer, <laughs> ask away. I'm happy to answer your question. Well, the, well your talk that was filmed today is available for us to show to other people who weren't here tonight. Uh, the reason we have all these cameras running is so that we will be able to share this information on our website. In fact, I'm glad you asked that question because these are just a few of the resource pages on my website. There's a wealth of information that, for example, if you're interested in pesticide addiction, there's a very well documented resource on pesticides. Uh, all kinds of things that you can go and get the information right now from my website. My goal is to leave something for posterity that will last through time and help the next generation be a whole lot better than I was when I started. Another one? Come on, I didn't intimidate everybody. <laughs> So earlier you, you asked a question, you said, why are bats important in restoring biodiversity? So I was just um, hoping that I could fill in some more notes. Oh, good. That's a great question. First of all, let me just point out that if you just look at cave ecosystems, bats provide the predominant energy that fuels whole cave ecosystems. Uh, a study done years ago by Bernie Steele from Auburn University in Bracken Cave showed that a single tablespoon full of bat guano in Bracken Cave can contain a thousand bacteria species and hundreds of gen genera. Now, you might say, oh, now we got proof that bats are dangerous. You know, what we don't seem to ever figure out is that, for example, these virus hunters these days are all out there trying to scare us about the dangerous viruses they're finding potentially dangerous viruses they're finding in bats. We have more viruses in our bodies than we have cells. Most viruses are obviously benign and may in fact be essential to our very survival. The same is probably true of bacteria. The bacteria from Bracken, instead of looking at them in shock and saying, oh my God, it must be a dangerous place, let's look at them from the positive side that Bernie Steele looked at them. He found bacteria that can de deactivate ammonia waste products from industry. He found bacteria that produce chitinase that can break down the chitin from seafood waste byproducts and turn it into gasohol. He found bacteria that had, uh, that were actually used by corporations to improve detergents. 
and um, just that one cave had a treasure trove of potential biodiversity depending on, that depended on bats. Now, quite aside from that, bats are essential to whole ecosystems from deserts to rainforests. Uh, remember those pictures I showed you of bats pollinating agaves and cacti? Hundreds of species from the U.S. all the way to Chile. And those are major niche-making plants that if you want to promote biodiversity or if you want to harm biodiversity, just take something that's important, all those kinds of essential plants out of the system. And I wish I'd had time to tell you more about the pollination side, too, because it's incredibly interesting. From my last geographic article, I was sent to the Andes of Ecuador to photograph some bat pollinated plants. And when I got there, I found something really incredible. I wish I'd been, had time to show you tonight. The Puya plants take a hundred years to reach maturity. A hundred years, they flower once and die. Think pollination's important? <laughs> Very. Okay, where do they live? Above Timberline in the Andes, where it's so cold bats can't live up there. So, how do they get pollinated? Nobody has yet solved this, but I'm betting on the solution. Just like the Andean condor, in the evening these bats are riding thermals up the Andes just like escalators in a shopping center. They're riding those thermals up, going up for a quick sip of nectar up high above timberline, coasting back down to the low valleys where they rear their young. We know the bats are up there pollinating the flowers. That, there's no question. We're just not sure who's carrying them up. It's probably the thermals that they're riding. Another question? Yeah. I saw a special a while ago about vampire bats that are being altruistic behavior. Is there anything about that? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> they, they exhibit altruism actually very similar to what humans exhibit. Uh, most of us aren't truly, truly unselfishly altruistic. We're more likely to help those who have helped us or, or would most likely help us in the future if not in the past. And vampire bats have very good memories. In fact, that gets me off track a little bit. I got to just for a second remind you about how intelligent bats are and how good their memories are. Vampires remember who did them favors, who fed them when they were hungry, who helped them in the past, and they return, they're much more likely to return favors in the future for those who've helped them in the past. Now back to one of my favorite bats, the froggy and bat trachops. <clears throat> We found that we could train these in just a few minutes. Uh, I'll say, I think now I could train them in 30 minutes. Used to take me two hours. Um, train them to come to our hand on call. You know that those bats, when they were marked and released back to the wild, remembered to come on call to a person's hand years later when recaptured? And there's a recent study out showing that two different species of myotis bats were trained to do things that, <clears throat> well, one of them was trained to do things that bats just don't ever learn to do on their own. It was shown that the bats just couldn't master the, the knowledge without somebody teaching them. Then they allowed the trained bats to associate with another species that hadn't been trained and the species that hadn't been trained suddenly learned the, learned the trick from the trained bats of a different species. Bats are just incredible. I wish I had the memory. I wish I could learn as fast as the bats. Uh, I, I mean, it's amazing. It's taken me 40 years to figure out things that I look back and wonder why I didn't figure them out in the first year. We're talking about bats whose bodies are about that big that you saw tonight were training me. Who would have ever believed that possible? We're discovering such amazing things about bats and 
I'm sure that there are going to be a whole lot more discovered about vampire bats. Uh, vampire bats are really special in that they, they have a treasure trove of molecules in their saliva that, that um, have been reported to uh, be of great potential value to modern medicine. Uh, they have social order that's probably a level above most other mammals. We would love vampires if we just didn't hate them so much. <laughs> <laughs> okay, enough about vampires. Anybody else? They're right here. Excuse me, I'm not the best of hearing. Oh, do bats ever d display affection? Yes. <clears throat> um, some of the first knowledge I had of that kind of thing. Uh, Sarah Steves here could probably tell you from her personal experience, she lives in Australia and deals with flying foxes. She's here visiting briefly. <clears throat> um, I remember years ago a woman named June Took. I published a story about her in one of my first issues of Bats Magazine. Uh, she hand reared a an or orphan flying fox, gradually released it back to the wild, and in the fall it migrated with the other bats and left for the winter. Next spring it came back, and <clears throat> one evening, to her great surprise, she's out in her backyard, and here this four-foot wingspan bat comes flying down out of the sky, lands on her shoulder, and is licking her and squealing in delight <laughs> uh, to see her again. Well. This went on for a few weeks, and then she realized that this bat was pregnant. Flying foxes, when they give birth to their pups, oftentimes carry them off to a different place and leave them at night so that the pythons or other predators that haunt the roosts don't get them. This mother bat would bring her pup to the woman who hand-reared her to babysit at night while she went out to feed. <laughs> And I know of another story, uh, a lady that lived by a national park in Sydney, and she had a flying fox that a friend raised, an orphaned one, and it developed rickets because it didn't have, they didn't know in those days exactly the nutrition it needed, and it, so it couldn't really fly and couldn't be released back to the wild, but the lady couldn't keep the bat anymore, so she brought it to her friend, and her friend let it live in her backyard and would feed it in the backyard, a free-ranging flying fox. Once a year, the woman who originally reared the bat would come back at Christmas time and bring it chocolates, and there is nothing that an Australian flying fox loves more than chocolate. <laughs> and year after year, Helen reported that when this gal came to her front door, as soon as she opened the door and spoke to the woman and the woman's voice could be heard, the flying fox in the backyard starts screaming, trying to get to her, excited to see her. And there are even instances I've heard of where flying foxes remembered their initial benefactors by voice after not having seen them for 10 years. And none of that really surprises me given that Trakoff's having been trained to come on call to a hand, still can remember to do that years later when recaptured from the wild. Okay, yeah. Um, would you, or would bats be classified as keystone species given all of the... I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time hearing again. Would um, bats be considered as a keystone species since they kind of play a major role in pollinating and insect control and would bats be considered a keystone species because of their important roles? Uh, many bats, as far as that can be taken, would be considered keystone species. There's no question that uh, whole ecosystems can be seriously threatened by the demise of bats that service those systems. I saw some other hands. Don't give up. Older age, 
it seems like scientists were losing, and just like, I mean, truth doesn't seem to be popular anymore, that they, people think they have more truth that they don't listen to scientists for just like climate change or many other things. They prefer to listen to what they want to hear instead of just listening to what you will tell the students. I'm glad you brought that up. I have what might be a slightly unpopular opinion to be voicing here. <laughs> but uh, I believe a lot of this can be laid at the feet of scientists themselves. We too often have done esoteric things that made no difference, just satisfied our curiosity and we didn't even communicate it well to the public when we did it. So eventually people start losing interest in what we do and faith in its value. And so we become more and more dependent instead of on government grants for research, we become more dependent on private grants from industries that usually have a private motivation behind what they give us and they expect us to find that uh, cigarettes are good for you and, you know, <laughs> and, and, and it seems like there's always a scientist around somewhere who's willing to find what they want found. And as long as scientists are desperate for funds because they didn't communicate well with the public and, and do really worthwhile things, they're going to be vulnerable to having to take what I'd call bad money and come to bad conclusions that leads to distrust of science. And there have been a whole series of papers, you can find them quickly uh, in the last several years about how prevalent bad science is these days, people uh, trying to prove instead of test hypotheses. And uh, so we brought that as scientists kind of on ourselves. And it's time that we, you know, just as recently as last June, there was a paper in Nature by leading uh, epidemiologists decrying this big scaremongering about the need to hunt for rare viruses as an inappropriate waste of the public money. And they actually said in that paper in Nature that this was going to come back to haunt scientists ruin, wrecking havoc with their reputation and credibility just at a time when science is most needed. We can't afford to keep getting bought off because we didn't do science the way we should have to begin with to develop credibility. Thank you. <laughs> what kind of camera do I use? That's a neat question. First of all, let me tell you a story. Several <laughs> years ago, I was at a, an international research conference, and um, a guy got up and made a presentation. It was really cool. He really had every little detail of his research well documented photographically. And um, so when he finished, <clears throat> I got him aside and said, you know, I'm, I'm really curious. That was one of the best presentations I've heard in years. Yeah, it's so well documented photographically. Uh, I never seem to be able to document my stuff that well because it's just too much hassle carrying all that heavy equipment around. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> He smiled, he said, here's my secret. He pulled out a little pocket point and shoot camera, Pentax, Optio Pentax, which at that time wasn't even probably a tenth as good as your average cell phone is today. And he just pointed out that having a camera was better than having no camera. <laughs> and it's amazing what you could do. I. I am amazed, there's a book coming out that you should probably know about, it's called Bats, A Guide to All Species, that's coming out through the Smithsonian uh, in April, early April. I'm the science editor and photographer for the book. One of my pictures in that book was taken with a point and shoot camera, I mean with a, with a cell phone, with not even a that good a cell phone. Um, it's better to have a, a, a reasonable cell phone picture than no picture. People think they have to have a lot of expensive equipment to take good pictures. Mostly you need to know what it takes to compose 
and find the right lighting and do it right. Uh, with modern cell phones, you can take all kinds of beautiful pictures with nothing more than a headlight. It's amazing what you can do. And there are books that you can probably buy for five dollars. I know Kodak used to produce little booklets on how to, how to compose your picture, how to get the lighting right. It is simple to learn good photography. And there is nothing that will pay you bigger dividends than being able to show people exactly what you do and why it's important. And to answer that question, I still haven't answered. <laughs> I now use a, a, a Sony. Uh, Teresa, what is it? It's a Sony A7R3. A7R3. <laughs> See, I don't even keep up with the cameras anymore. They change so fast. For a long time, I used Canons. But um, it's not necessary to have a big, fancy camera. People don't expect you to stop the motion perfectly. Like, I'll bet I could have taken a cell phone picture of a bat coming into a pitcher plant and had people ooh and ah over it. Sure, the wings would have been blurred a little bit. It would have just given a different artsy effect. <laughs> you don't have to have a lot of money and expensive gear to do good photography. We have no excuse if we don't learn to communicate. And I hear people all the time say, well, it terrifies them to speak in public. No excuse for being terrified about speaking in public either. There's not a kid around who wouldn't like you to tell him a story. Practice on them. <laughs> when you go to a party and you see a friend who's really good at entertaining everybody with his or her stories, watch how they do it. You can do it too. It's just a matter of paying attention. Things you do, I mean, if you're doing research that has no interest, quit. <laughs> Any more questions? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. There's two. I'll take the one in back first and then you next. If you're uh, presenting to the public and you have someone ask you, like if they have bats on the property, what can I do for those bats or how can I prevent things like white nose syndrome from spreading? What would you tell them? Uh, first of all, don't even spend any time worrying about white nose syndrome spreading. I know that's not going to be a popular statement. First of all, white nose syndrome is going to spread everywhere it can spread. It's not stoppable. The good news is that just as probably happened many years earlier in Asia and Europe, there are resistant individuals that are gradually surviving and beginning to rebuild populations. If you look in the northeastern United States where it hit 10 years ago, I know of single colonies there that were 500 bats in them before white nose syndrome and that are now 500 again post white nose syndrome and we're talking about one of the two species hardest hit. Uh, there's nothing we can do to stop it. It's White nose syndrome is, I, I just published a new resource on climate, climate change in bats. Read that resource. Um, in there I talk about white nose syndrome in the US versus heat stroke of killing thousands of bats in Australia. I don't know if you've heard recently, but Sarah could certainly tell you. Uh, where she lives in Keynes, Australia, uh, tens of thousands of flying foxes have died in, in just a few days time from heat stroke. And those problems are very similar to our problems with white nose syndrome, even though they're dramatically different. What they are is they're the result of accumulated stress that we have ignored for decades. For over a hundred years, flying foxes in Australia have been losing their giant old ancient uh, trees that were sometimes two, three hundred feet tall along river systems and they could move up and down in those trees over the rivers and find exactly the temperature they wanted by just getting into more or less sun. 
Now in my resource I just published, take a look and I show a huge ancient gum tree and then you see the regrowth around it, they look like matchsticks almost. And these bats have lost their choice places to roost. They've had to move into urban environments to find roosts at all. And so today, when a heat wave comes along, they are just set up, ready to die in mass, because they're already, they've moved to an urban environment where it's probably four or five degrees hotter than it was where they naturally should have been roosting. They've lost the diversity of roost type that they had. And now, where does that translate to being analogous to white nose syndrome? Our bats in America have gradually lost their original roosting habitat. And for example, <coughs> uh, if you go to my resource on, uh, let's see here, Finding, Protecting, Restoring America's Historic Bat Caves. Go to that one, <coughs> and you'll find my story about Mammoth Cave. Mammoth Cave, Kentucky is the largest cave known anywhere in the world, about 400 miles of passages, huge volume, multiple entrances at different levels. It used to trap a wide range of warm and cold air, provide very stable climate for bats, and if you had an extraordinary heat wave or cold spell, the bats could just move up or down the wall to get the temperature they wanted. They were okay. That one cave conservatively harbored more than 10 million hibernating bats each winter. Probably tens of millions. There was a newspaper, the way this first came to our attention, there was a newspaper article that was published in the 1860s, I believe, and it said that miles of the passages were covered solidly by great masses of bats every winter. Well, we all know you can't trust the news media for that kind of information. But it caused the Park Service to start, you know, wondering. They had never seen large numbers of bats in the time they had owned the cave, but they started wondering. They asked me and a group of experts to come check we spent a day checking and in one day found evidence of more than 10 million hibernating bats. No question, the paleontological evidence of the skulls and bones, the stained limestone where they roosted, uh, and we got to checking and found that a professor from, I can't remember now, if it was one of the big name Eastern schools, had gone down to check and see if there were really all these millions of bats that were claimed to be in Mammoth Cave and he wrote up and published a report on it. I think he was from Princeton. And in his report he said, and I saved voucher specimens that I sent to the Smithsonian. So I went to the Smithsonian to see the voucher specimens. Guess what they are? Endangered gray and Indiana bats. Uh, two species that were probably among the most abundant mammals that ever lived in eastern North America, both on the endangered list. Uh, Losing sites like that have just proven devastating in the stress levels for bats. The bats lost these secure bastions of survival. Now when you get something like a, an extra fungus comes along to stress them or a heat wave or something else, they're far more susceptible than they probably would have been if we had been paying attention sooner. So if you want to save bats, and help them recover from white nose syndrome, instead of trying to find a cure, which we cannot do, it won't work, instead of trying to find a cure, find these places where they once lived in great security and help restore some of those so that they can return and rebuild. And I have done that actively in my career and can t tell you that it works. At Mammoth Cave National Park, there was one section of the cave that we found that used to house at least hundreds of thousands of hibernating bats. I appealed to the Park Service to, un they had concrete over that cave entrance. I appealed to them to take the concrete out and put a bat friendly gate in. And it took something like five years of appeals before they finally allowed us to remove the concrete and put a bat gate in. And they even went so far as to claim that 
they had engineers checking that if they removed the concrete, the cave would collapse. The concrete was holding the cave up. Well, just the other day, a colleague of mine showed me some really spectacular footage of swarming endangered Indiana bats at a cave gate. And uh, I said, I'm curious, where is that? Turned out to be the site that we got restored at Mammoth Cave. There's Hubbard's Cave, if you read in that fine, protecting, restoring historic bat caves. I got that one protected more than 20 years ago. The bats would have now been completely extirpated there, but after protecting them and restoring, we now have reclaimed over 400,000. We know it can be done. We know how to do it. We've just got to enough of us care enough and educate enough other people to care enough that politicians and other decision makers start paying attention. It's as simple as that. You mentioned in your presentation about the uh, research that you did and that the, uh, the science to help people. But how would, how would you conserve a species that may not be that interesting or beneficial to the human population? Okay, the question was, how do you conserve a species that may not be all that exciting or beneficial? Uh, <clears throat> now you're asking me to come up with the ultimate unpopular answer. <laughs> One of the first papers that I enjoyed reading way back when I was starting my conservation career, was published, I believe it was in Time or Newsweek, and it was titled, Why Don't We Pull the Plug on the Condor and Ferret? And it basically said, why are we spending millions of dollars trying to save basket cases that could no longer make it in the wild while we're ignoring species that make a very big difference? And they actually named my gray bats as the example of the ones that would make a difference. And in fact, the gray bat, for a tiny fraction of what's been spent on condors, has, in 1960, 69, that species was in such dire shape that it was predicted that it would soon become extinct. And uh, as a result of conservation actions carefully taken, we now have millions more gray bats than when their extinction was predicted. Done at a tiny fraction of the cost that is taken to save condors that still can't survive on their own in the wild. We have to feed them to keep them alive in the wild. These are like zoo birds in the wild. Uh, I hear all the time about, you know, it's popular in terms of raising money to sell you on the idea of you've got a chance, you know, if you just give us another thousand dollars or something, we can save this rare animal, the final ten of them from extinction, and you'll have done it. It appeals to people. But truthfully, I would be interested in saving the last 10 of a species that had a track record of once having been a key role player in the environment. I'd put a high priority on that as long as it really was feasible to do something to recover it. Sometimes it's not. Um, but you know, in the modern world, we're going to have to start setting some serious priorities. And just as if you, if you were investing in the stock market, Let's say somebody just died and left you a billion dollars worth of investments in the stock market. You wouldn't just start selling those off willy-nilly tomorrow. You'd try to figure out which ones were going to be worth something in the future and which ones weren't. And we have harmed nature to the point these days where we're going to have some very tough decisions that we're going to have to make and we're going to have to live with them. And some of those decisions are going to have to be Instead of spending millions trying to save a species that is almost certain to go extinct anyway, let's spend a few thousand to keep one from going on the endangered list. I can't tell you how frustrated I have found it almost my whole career, especially when I started conserving bats. I'd go to a foundation for funds to help bats. They'd say, is it endangered? We only, we only help endangered species. Well, it's not endangered yet, but if it becomes endangered, it's going to seriously threaten a whole ecosystem. 
I mean, species like, for instance, free-tailed bats here in Texas knock out bracken cave, and it's like knocking out the trout hatchery for a whole wide area. And um, we just can't afford to let these simple things happen just because the species isn't officially endangered yet. I am much more interested personally in preventing the endangerment of key ecological role players than I am in trying to bring one back from the edge that was always, I mean, many of these endangered species that we hear so much about protecting live on islands as just, they're, they're, they never were common, they're, they're always rare to begin with, and uh, then we're asked to spend a huge amount of money saving them when saving them won't make hardly any difference to other species in the planet. We're going to have to start paying more attention to where we can do the most good and the choices are not going to be nice, but that's the world we've created and we're going to have to live that way. I would probably, you know, there's always a trick in everything, uh, but I'd probably say the ecosystem. Uh, I, as an ecologist, I have to be much more concerned about ecosystem health than species health. Uh, the ecosystem, once it goes, you're going to lose probably thousands of species. You got to protect the ecosystem that supports all those species, and uh, just just trying to piecemeal spend large amounts of money saving individual species if they don't contribute to the good of the whole. Uh, I'd be careful how much I want to invest. Sure. As a follow up to that, uh, is there a good way to get the public or to care about the ecosystem as a whole? A lot of times it's easier to get them to care for a singular species, which is why we end up funding so much to save an endangered species, but not really protect the habitat or the ecosystem itself. Well, here would be, <clears throat> here would be my approach. <clears throat> Go to Southeast Asia, for example, and on a single trip, I visited more than 10 caves in one country that had formerly had tens to hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of bats in them that were totally extirpated by people just eating too many. Restoring those bats <clears throat> can be of huge ecological and economic value, as I demonstrated at Khao Chon Pond Cave, which was the only one on that trip where I had the power to say, okay, you own this cave, hire a game warden to protect it. But if you if you don't <clears throat> pay attention to saving places like that, you're dooming the whole system eventually. And uh, I find it so much more practical. For example, I can go to a place like Khao Chong Prawn and say, okay, hire a game warden, do this and actually have measurable results within a measurable amount of time. Time and again, I could give you more than a dozen cases of reestablishing hundreds of thousands of bats from a single, simple, inexpensive conservation action. When that happens, <clears throat> get in there and document the impact of the bats. That's where we need real science. Show how people benefited by taking that first step. That's why I'm so disappointed that recently the funding was turned down to a group of scientists that wanted to document the economics at Khao Chong Prawn and how valuable those bats were. If we could just document conclusively the value of those bats, there would be communities all over clamoring to save their bats. I Paul and I were in Phnom Penh, Cambodia a couple of years ago in a town not far out of Phnom Penh. There was a bat cave that during the time of the Khmer Rouge, they hadn't protected those bats and the bats had all, pretty much all been eaten and there were very few left, but when the Khmer Rouge left, the local people remembered how valuable the bat guano used to be for fertilizer 
and the local village chief set up 24 hour a day protection of the cave. The bats started to rebuild population by the time we reached the area. The guano sales had reached $50,000 a year already. Uh, in the Mekong Delta, we visited areas I could show you pictures where we showed that people were taking and cutting palm fronds, drying them in the sun, wiring them together in bundles of like five or six in a bundle, hoisting them back up into palm trees up 40, 50 feet above ground, tying 10 of these around a palm tree trunk so it made a big skirt. And these are artificial bat houses that the people on their own without any outside scientists telling them it was a good idea had figured out to do. How did I know about it? Because a famous war correspondent from the Vietnam era had seen these and wrote me a letter saying, someday you ought to take a look at this, it's pretty interesting. Well, those people didn't even know that the bats were eating crop pests, they just knew that the fertilizer was valuable. But if you can start with just little things like that, showing them how to expand artificial roosts, how to restore a bat cave. And once they do that, and you can document the good that came from that, then you can say, hey, you know, you could probably expand even more bats if you just protect some natural habitat over here and over here and over here. You know, even fence rows between crops can make a difference. And so you get that first nucleus of bats in a cave or an artificial roost, and oftentimes there's going to be a limit to how far they can expand because you've got monoculture beyond and there's nothing for them to eat. But it gives you a foothold for saying, okay, now we're going to start building our populations back, and you get the uh, development of biodiversity. I showed you the Mediterranean site where they wouldn't have been successful had it not been for the natural forest a mile or so away. Um, that's all, I think, a wonderful opportunity to start with bats because bats, you can get measurable, visible results that people can understand and then you can start moving outward into other things that are less understandable for them. So I think bats make a wonderful first model for starting to restore biodiversity. Did I set a record for length of an answer? <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else brave enough to ask a question? What's your favorite bat? What's my favorite bat? <laughs> Uh, actually, I don't have a favorite bat. It tends to be the kind I worked with most recently, I guess. But, um, you know, I would have said years ago that my favorite bats were the large carnivores because I thought they were exceptionally brilliantly smart. But, um, you know, since then I found out that these little tiny woolly bats are smarter than I ever dreamed the carnivores could be. In fact, I remember Jack Bradbury used to be a really big time up and coming bat scientist many years ago. And he was going to study the big uh, carnivorous bat vampire spectrum and perform uh, experiments on their intelligence. A year after he announced that he was going to do that, I met him somewhere and I said, Jack, how did your experiments of vampire come? He said, oh, it was terrible. The bat was much smarter than I was. <laughs> but uh, truthfully, uh, within a single species of bat, I find huge range of personality and intelligence. And, and in the study where one species trained another species, they actually found that some were far faster learners than others. Some could learn in almost minutes and some in hours and some didn't. <laughs> and uh, in fact, that's one of the secrets to my success in taking pictures of bats. I'll, if at all possible, and especially if I know it's going to be a hard species to photograph, I'll catch half a dozen of them and test them quickly. I have little things I can do to test them and see what their personalities are. 
And uh, sometimes for a shot, I actually want a dumb bat. <laughs> and sometimes I want a really smart bat. And I'll pick them that way. And there are ways of figuring it out, just like with people. <laughs> and, and just like with people, you'll have your favorites and ones that aren't so favorites. Favorite adventure stories, oh, come on. <laughs> well, uh, there was a time that I got caught by communist terrorists while I was out with Charlie Handley, my mentor. <laughs> uh, he had given me my first big time employment after college and sent me off on an expedition to lead an expedition in Venezuela. And we'd gotten there ahead of most of our equipment. We were working way up high in the mountains above Caracas. And uh, Charlie came down to visit, and I wanted to really impress him, showing him some really cool bats. And so I, I borrowed a Jeep. Now, this brings up a whole other area that we didn't talk about tonight. One of the keys to success in life is learning to win friends instead of battles. At that time in Venezuela, as, as I got there to lead my first big project for the Smithsonian, 65 police a year were being shot and killed on the streets of Caracas by communist insurgents. There were 50 caliber tank battles going on at the university. I mean, it was not a safe place to be. You couldn't go into a bank without going by machine gun emplacements and sandbags out in front. Well, amidst all that, my group had an in with the president of the country, and so we were given a place to stay way up in the mountains in a really perfect kind of a hangout for the old dictator who had been ousted. And uh, it turned out that the guy that was managing this place was head of the local Communist Party. And um, I found out who he was, but, you know, I have never shunned somebody because of their isms. And we used to just tease each other after we got to know each other. He'd call me his uh, amigo commie. <laughs> I mean, his amigo yonkey, and I'd call him uh, my me amigo commie. <laughs> and uh, so when Charlie Handley came down to visit, I asked this guy if I could borrow his Jeep so I could show Handley some really cool places for bats. So here we are driving the Communist Party leader's Jeep when we get caught by the communists. <laughs> and uh, believe me, it was one wild chase when they caught us. We were up on a really rugged road with 200 foot cliffs off the side, no rails or anything to keep you from sliding off the road. Wild chase, they caught us. But after they caught us, fortunately, instead of shooting us right off, they figured out that we were in the communist party boss's Jeep. And so they radioed him, and you never saw a guy have more fun than when he came driving back in his Jeep. And he said, ah, see, si, paga bueno to near amigos commies. <laughs> <laughs> so that's just one. There are plenty, plenty, plenty of stories. You can buy the book. <laughs> there are a number of those stories in, in my book, The Secret Lives of Bats, which uh, a couple of my young lady staff would be well, ha very happy to sell you tonight, and I'd be happy to s sign your copy if you're interested. Well, let's give a big hand to Dr. Tuttle and Mary. <laughs> Thank you. I'm the one that should be doing the clapping. You guys are an outstanding audience. <laughs> and without an outstanding audience, there's no such thing as an outstanding speaker. <laughs> uh, again, thanks everyone for coming out. I saw a lot of new faces, so this was great. Um,
Dr. Tuttle has his books for sale, uh, The Secret Life of Bats, and uh, the Bat Association also unveiled our first two new t-shirts today, and we have those for sale right over at the table. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping, if you are a member and you haven't paid your dues yet, please do. But uh, thanks again for coming out and uh, supporting us in this great event. Um, it's very, very important. And thanks this whole group for your concern for bats.